Hello and welcome to I'll Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Drea Renee Knits and this is a little weekly podcast where I do my best to answer some of your questions, mostly about knitting, but sometimes we dabble with some other things like spinning, other fiber stuff. Who knows? Who knows what's going to come up in the questions? So today I am wearing the Straya cardigan. This is knit up in ampersand fibers from La Mercerie and is an Insta Friends knit along pattern from a few years ago. And I'm wearing it with my Wilder gown that I made a couple years ago as well. And it's an outfit that I kind of forgot about. And all of a sudden today I was like, you know, I just feel like wearing a dress. And so here we are. And I love when you rediscover an old outfit, they're like, oh, that outfit. Um, this cardigan is a little bit of a labor of love. It is made using half fisherman's rib, which gives it that super classic stitch. It almost feels like a ready to wear sweater with that ribbing. Um, it's, it takes a little bit of time that half fisherman's rib, but I feel like it ends up then being such a solid wardrobe steeple because of the fabric it creates. And I just love these little single row stripes. I think they're so effective. I love that they're only one row in height. Um, and the color palette from this yarn line is so pretty. So anyways, it's a goodie, it's goodie. It is gloomy here today. It's very rainy. So slippers and a cozy sweater feel right. Um, let's go ahead and jump into some questions. Question number one today is about the tessellated pullover and blocking. My question is, if you are using a Surrey alpaca for yarn C and a superwash yarn for A and B, how would you wash the final sweater? Honestly, I've never machine washed a sweater. I'm not sure I would anyway, but I am wanting that option in case my sweater grows too much and needs a little dryer time. So... If you look, I wish I had a skein of one of these yarns in front of me, but I don't. So if you look at a lot of hand dyed superwash yarn, if you look at that label, even though it's a superwash yarn, most of them recommend still hand washing. Um, so I totally get the wanting to maybe have the dryer just in case it's grown too big and you wanna try and shrink it up that way. Um, it's something that I would definitely say proceed with caution. But I know even just through here that people have done it <clears throat> when they didn't think about how much that superwash yarn might grow and it did help tighten things up for them. So it's something that I know people utilize, but as far as that Surrey alpaca, I don't know how that would react in a dryer. One thing you could do is you can take your swatch and you can throw that in your dryer and see what happens. See if that alpaca freaks out, see if it's okay. But my biggest piece of advice would be to do a large swatch and block it and dry it and try to get as close to the necessary gauge as possible so that you don't have to worry about trying to do the dryer trick to shrink that sweater up because you already know it's going to end up hopefully within the measurements you want it to be because that's what your swatch has told you. Um, that's just going to be a little bit of a more foolproof method. And as far as how I would wash it, I, no matter what, wash all my hand knits the same. So I don't vary it depending on what the yarn is made of, but I thought this was such a great question, especially when you are mixing different, <sighs> it's that part of the afternoon <laughs> where I can already feel like my brain's like, you don't need this word. I'm not gonna give it to you. <laughs> um, what do I wanna say? Fiber, I feel like it starts with a C, content. Okay, so, when you're mixing different fiber contents and all that, if you're hand washing, it shouldn't matter. You can still hand wash it the same way. Really the only thing that I pay attention to is the temperature of my water. And if I need to be careful with my temperature of water to avoid felting or um, 
color bleeding, things like that. If I'm worried about felting or color bleeding, I'm gonna keep my water on the cooler side. If I'm not, I actually like my water for washing my woolens quite hot because I find that it helps soften the yarn. It gets a really good bloom. It just helps really saturate the yarn all the way to the core. The warmer the water, the better it permeates the fiber. Um, a bit more quickly than cold water. Cold water is going to take a little bit longer to soak into that fiber. Um, but my recommendation would be to hand wash all your woolens. Um, that's just what I feel most comfortable with. I also think that it keeps them, it helps them hold up longer. So even super wash yarns over time, going through your washing machine, it can cause them to break down quicker because it's a rougher process than if we just hand wash them. So that's something to consider too. That being said, I know there's people out there who love a certain super wash yarns that they've had great success with using in their washer, maybe their dryer, um, and they're happy with that. I just personally, I stick with the hand washing because I just feel like it's safe. <laughs> I know I know what's going to happen there. Because um, I also, especially with a sweater, when woolens get waterlogged, yarn, especially wool yarn, can hold a lot of water weight. And so when you think about it, when it's being tossed around in a machine, I just imagine things getting stretched in a way that I don't want them to, where when I wash them in my sink, they're not having all that agitation. There's a sleeve's not going to end up all stretched out. So it just makes me feel more comfortable. Um, but that's just how I feel. So I would say the great way to figure it out for yourself is use that swatch manipulate that all you want if it gets destroyed in the dryer now you know and it's okay because it was just your swatch instead of doing it with the whole sweater first so swatches can tell us so much more than our gauge right they can tell us if the colors are going to bleed they can tell us if we like the drape they can tell us what's the best way to block and dry this item so utilize those swatches for all that information before you have to tempt fate with your sweater the next question is, I am slowly saving up for a spinning wheel and trying to be patient with the process. Spinning wheels are a big investment. Um, there are some extras I would like to get with it, including a blending board to make Rolex and yarn texture, which is one of my favorite spinning books. Uh, now I have enough to buy the book along with a drop spindle to just get started. What would you do as a beginner spinner? Would it be helpful to read about spinning prior to getting the actual wheel or try to get them both at the same time? With your new love for drop spinning, it has made me consider starting with that. Thank you so much for your opinion. So if it were me, and this is just the way I take in information, if I just read information, it slowly evaporates from my brain. I need to put it into practice for that information to click and make sense and for it to be helpful for me. I'm very much like, okay, here's the thing, but now I have to do it myself for it to all come together. So that's personal. I definitely think getting the book and getting excited and starting to learn about all the things, there's a lot of information that comes with spinning. And so learn starting to learn it beforehand is awesome. Um, so kind of up to you on how you'd want to do it. I would want to be able to put some of these lessons into practice as I'm reading them. But if you're somebody who's like, give me the information up front, that way when I'm ready to put it into practice, I've got it hanging out in my brain, whichever works for you. Um, I think that the spindle can be a great jumping off point because it's just a lot more financially accessible. That being said, there are some spinning wheels nowadays especially like the little electric e-wheels that are comparable in price to some spindles. You know, spindles can be upwards of, I think I've even seen one on the Ravelry D-Stash. I feel like like $200. They can obviously be way less expensive than that, like $15. Um, but I think you can even get some like the Nano e-wheel. I wish I had that price, um, but I think you can get it for maybe $200. So it's just more accessible than say some of the bigger wheels that are gonna run upwards of a thousand, some are 2000, they can get really expensive. So I think spindles are a great entry point. One other thing I was gonna throw out there is 
It's been really interesting in hindsight. I learned how to spin on a wheel before a spindle. I really didn't think spindles were gonna be my thing. And now my poor wheels are so neglected because I love my support spindles so much. That being said, I think I would have had a hard time learning to spin on a support spindle. I think if I didn't already have some of that information and muscle memory, and I had just tried to go straight support spindle, I don't know how that would have gone for me. Drop spindle, I think is an easier entry point than the supported. I did have a friend who tried to start with the drop spindle and it just wasn't clicking for them. And then they learned on a wheel that clicked, worked out so great for them. And then they actually went back to the drop spindle. And now that they already knew how to draft and they understood twist, the drop spindle clicked for them and then they enjoyed it. So everybody's path is, different. Um, so yes, I think that a drop spindle could be a great place to start. Um, one other thing I would consider looking into is seeing if you have a local fiber shop or a guild where you could maybe borrow or rent a wheel. You can also look at things um, like community newsletters. I think I'm not on Facebook. I haven't been for over a decade, so I don't know a lot about this, but Facebook marketplace, <laughs> Craigslist, is that still kicking around? Um, online local things where people would sell things. You would be amazed by how many amazing fiber tools get sold in like estate sales, um, all kinds of stuff. I know friends who picked up wheels at yard sales. Sometimes people are just giving them away because they were relatives and they don't know what to do with them. So they're like, ah, does anybody want this thing? So keep an eye out that way as well because that might get you that wheel experience that you're looking for. Um, but the nice thing, I started with wheel rental. I learned how to spin at my local fiber shop fiber and with the class the class was I think like four Saturdays over a month and I got to rent the wheel for that whole time and if you end up buying a wheel through the shop you get that price discounted like your rental gets taken off the price so it's a great way to try out wheels before committing because that's the other thing about that bigger price point of the spinning wheel is you want to make sure you get the one that clicks with you I tend to be excitable and I'm like oh I'm just gonna dive in and like get this one it'll be great but thankfully I did have access and do have access to that shop because when I wanted to get a Saxony style wheel for long draw so there's different types of spinning wheels and I wanted the one that you like if you watch Cinderella like the one we think of as like the Cinderella spinning wheel where the wheel sideways to you that I had an idea of what I thought I wanted and thankfully I could go try out a few different ones at the shop because what I thought I wanted is not what I ended up buying. And I actually saved myself quite a bit of money because I went with a very different wheel that had a much lower price point, but was way easier for me to spin on. So I was really surprised by that. And if I hadn't been able to go try that out, I wouldn't have known that. So anyways, this is kind of a long-winded answer to say, I think that there's lots of options. I love your idea of starting with maybe that book and um, a drop spindle. I also think that there are other great resources while you're starting to learn um, and you can get them from your library. There's great classes online. So all that information may be really helpful to yarn texture. I feel like for me is one of those books that's kind of, it's not necessarily going to teach you how to spin, but it is going to inspire and teach you so much about how you make decisions on how you want to spin the yarn you're trying to create. Um, so anyways, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I have my coffee about an hour and a half ago and I'm like, I should have recorded this closer to that coffee time, but we're going to keep pushing through. So I'm getting ready to start junction and notice there are no short rows at the back neck. I think I'd like to add some, but I'm curious how to do it with the folded collar. Would you recommend knitting the short rows before joining the two layers of the collar? or add a plain section after the join and before the brioche. I'm, finally, I'm fine on the math, but figuring out the placement is stumping, stumping me. So I think you have options. You could absolutely do it a couple different ways. I think 
If I was gonna make it as simple as possible, I would make one of two choices. Not that you're asking for a simple solution, but just one that you wouldn't have to do quite as much fiddling is I would either A, forego the folded collar and pop those short rows right into the ribbing. I do that a lot when I don't wanna disrupt the direct patterning that I want to have happen right after <clears throat> I knit the collar. So instead of doing a folded collar, do just a regular ribbed collar and put the short rows right in there, right within your ribbing. That's what I did on Metamorphic and I really, really love how that turned out. Um, you could technically do that on a folded collar, but the thing is, is you're gonna need to mirror those short rows for above and below your fold line. So it's just trickier. You're gonna have to do them in two spots and have a mirror. So it's a little more finicky. The other option would be keep the folded collar and put in those short rows right before you do the brioche, just like you mentioned. And I think that would look great. That is how I would say the majority of round yoke uh, patterns that I see coming out these days, that is where they're placed. And so sometimes you will see just some plain knit area um, above between the collar and where you're going to start your patterning. So it just kind of depends on visually what you would prefer. Uh, if the folded collar aspect is really important to you and you love the look of that, then I would go ahead and place them between the collar and the brioche. If you're like, Meh, I'm not, I'm not married to the folded collar, then I would probably just do a regular ribbed collar and throw them right into the ribbing. That way you can jump right into the patterning as it's written in the pattern. Good luck. All right. Next question. I just finished my first traveler cowl and I love how you incorporate instructions for substituting for a different yarn weight or gauge. I am curious if the same would be applicable to your inclinations cowl pattern. How would you swap weights in this pattern, if at all? So that is a great question. I actually did knit my daughter an inclinations cowl using my hand spun, which was a different weight than what the pattern called for and I knit hers to a slightly different size because I was making it small for her and so you absolutely can as long as you are comfortable modifying and playing so the main thing to know is that cowl is half fisherman's rib and half fisherman's rib grows more than you think it's going to. That's why it's knit on such a small needle. Typically the needle is quite a bit smaller than the needle size you would usually use for the yarn weight that you're picking. So for instance, this sweater is a fingering weight sweater. Usually for a fingering weight sweater, I would maybe knit that on a four, a US four. For this sweater, it's a US two. And that's just because it's a looser stitch. So if you knit it on a four, it's gonna be too open and holy for the visual effect I was going for. So if you change yarn weights for the inclinations call, the first thing you do need to think about is that you're also going to change your needle size and it might be different than what you would typically go for. I think a good place to start would maybe be going down two needle sizes for what you would typically pick for that yarn weight. All right, next up is knitting it to a dimension instead of a specific, instead of following the directions exactly as written. So the trick there is going to be that that stitch pattern grows so much. So you know what I would do is if I wasn't sure, I would give it a steam block or even throw it on waste yarn and wet block it when you think you're getting to the point where it's about long enough before you go to the next section. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, but basically, if you look at the schematic of where you want those finished dimensions to be, which is going to be about the second to last page of the pattern, you can look on there. You can do your section one. When you think you're getting close, give it a steam block and see at, once it's grown a little bit from steam blocking it, okay, it's reaching those dimensions. I think that's pretty good. I'm going to move on to section two. Um, so on and so forth. I would take good notes because usually section one and section three of that type of cowl are really similar in their shaping as in you want to do a similar amount of increases in the beginning to decreases in that section three. So you, that's going to help you kind of end up with the same side lengths. Um, but the main area you're going to want to keep an eye on is that middle section because that's where you're going to see a lot of growth in that stitch pattern post blocking. So when you think you're getting close 
to that point with section two, wet block or at least steam block it to see how much it grows and make sure you're getting close to the dimensions you want at your new gauge. So I hope that makes sense and you could definitely do it. I did it and it was totally fine. Um, and remember, it's a cowl. It just needs to fit over your head. <laughs> so maybe you're on the side of a little too big then a little too small, um, but play around and I'm sure it'll be great. All right, for the last question of the day. I know you tend to pick your spinning fiber based on colors, but what breeds have you found that you love or maybe didn't love? Any breeds you love for certain types of projects? So I've talked about this a little bit on here because one of my first sweater quantities that I spun up, I was just trying to think of like where it fell in the line. Um, with CVM from Michigan, from an Etsy shop there. And I've talked about it in past episodes, but it actually ended up being the yarn that I knit up the Weekender Crew in that I released last year. So I did one in Brooklyn Tweed Dapple, and then I did one in my hand spun. And I had held on to that hand spun since I had finished it because I was so excited about how that yarn turned out. I actually have quite a bit of it left. I need to see how much. I'm almost wondering if I could stretch it into another sweater. Um, but anyway, so CVM has a very special place in my heart because I just had such a great experience with it and I love, love, love how the finished yarn turned out. I am a pretty equal opportunity fiber enthusiast. I do tend to prefer wools. You know, that's what I'm going for. Um, so what I don't love, straight up alpaca. I am not going to spin straight alpaca it is too floppy for my liking. I want something with bounce and memory. If I'm gonna have alpaca in something, I want it to be blended and to be not too, too much alpaca. Um, I like its softness and I have um, a healthy respect for alpaca. I mean, I love some Surrey alpaca yarns and things like that, but as far as spinning goes, I'm never gonna spin a straight alpaca yarn. Um, it's just not my GM. So love CVM, don't love 100% alpaca. Um, and what else do I love or hate? I don't know why, this window's just like calling to me right now. I'm just, <laughs> it's like I'm ready for my afternoon. Look out the window and daydream. Um, okay, so what other breeds have I found that I love? I really, again, I'm kind of open to trying anything. I've had great experiences with some Merino, Polworth, Targhee, Rambouillet. I love anything that has a lot of oomph once I've washed my yarn and it puffs. Like that to me is so satisfying. I like a squishy yarn. I like to do a tight twist. So I like something that plumps back against all the twist I like to put in. Um, so I love all of those. I'm good with Corydale. It's not my favorite, but I don't mind it. Um, it's not something that I'm typically seeking out to spin though. I think it can be great in the beginning when you are learning to spin, um, but sometimes it's just a little long in staple length for me. Some of the ones I've experienced where I didn't love how long the staple length was. Now I'm sure there's gonna be some people on here like, what? It, you know, every every sheep is different and it might've just been that one experience. I just had that one experience with some long Corydale that I didn't love spinning. Um, I also am hot and cold with Falkland. Falkland is not my favorite, probably because I ended up doing a sweaters quantity worth of Falkland and it just was not my favorite spin and I'd already committed to the sweaters quantity and so I kind of had to suffer through it. So make sure you really, really love the fiber before you end up doing a sweaters quantity in it because otherwise you kind of have to muscle through. Um, but there are so many glorious fibers out there and blends, combining the different fibers. So yeah, I'm open to most of them, but I think, I think I shy away a little bit from like the, the longer, the longer lock lengths. I fight with them a little bit. So there you go. Silk, I had a really fun conversation with my friend Melly about silk because I was like, mm, I don't, I don't love a shiny. 
So that's something I've learned about myself too. I'm not big into a shiny yarn. I don't need a lot of shine or luster. Um, I do love a little halo though. Hence why I like like the Surrey Alpaca, um, what have you. But Melly talked me in and trying out a little sample of, was it Merino and Silk? I think it was Merino and Silk. I actually have it right here. So here it is. This is my little sample spun up and processed by Melly Knits and it wasn't too much. I can, my children just got home from school, so I should end this soon because it's about to get loud. Um, but I love the little bit that's in here. I think it was like 15% silk and she swayed me. I'm like, okay, that was nice to spin. And I'm, I like how the yarn turned out. Ooh. I spun that on my spindles. All right, I'm just rambling. So I'm gonna leave that there. Hopefully you got something out of that little bit. I have a little show and tell, and then I'll let y'all go enjoy your weekend. So I have a couple spinning projects going. I also have some knitting projects going, but it's hard, it's hard. I never get to show you what I'm knitting because it's almost always a new design that's not gonna come out for a while. <laughs> So I wish I could show you more of my knits. I did show you my new socks. I'll, hang, I'll show you them again. I think I showed them last week. These are my new DRK Everydays. Look at, they're all pretty and blocked. The first washing always gets a block on the sock blockers. So I'm really excited to wear those. And otherwise I am working on more spindle spins. So this is currently, I have actually a couple of these already done. Spindles full of, this is Miss Jackson from Melly Knits. It's this beautiful, what is Miss Jackson? I should have this, <laughs> it might be part Corydale, which is so funny that I was just like, I don't know how I feel about Corydale. Um, but I can't remember, I'm not anti Corydale. Let's just say that. Uh, but I can't remember exactly what Miss Jackson is. I am enjoying spinning her up though. This is my swatch. I'd already done a little sample of it. A little dark for you to really ooh, maybe if we tilt what if we do a tilt and then here it is in a little cake just in case you want to see so i'm working on that that is a sweater that is a sweater spin that is a sweater spindle spin so that's going to take me some time because it's a sweater's quantity that i'm going to spin on spindles then I am working on, so I needed to get a little color in my life too, because I know that I'm going to be long hauling with Miss Jackson and that it's going to, it's a lot of dark brown to spin on my spindles. That's going to take me some time. So I needed a side colorful project. So I also am working on some stickle bats that I got from Ingle Nook and I came up with how I plan to do it today. Again, it's going to be spun on my support spindles. There she is. So my first two colors are already spun up onto here. So it's going to be a gradient. So you could kind of see it's like this yellowy, beautiful goldenrod. So here's how it's going to go. So then it will be this and then this. Actually, nope, I lied. It's going to, well, I have a picture. I, it's going to be like this. Do, 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 do. So then those three followed by... Is this how I'm doing it? I think then like this. I don't know. I'm going to have to reference my picture. <laughs> but it's going to be beautiful. And I did take some glamour shots. So I'll have to share those in my newsletter. Um, so that you can really see how beautiful it's going to be. And that's going to be a three-ply yarn. And my plan, I already divvy, I weighed everything. I divvied it all up. I'm actually going to see if I can show you a picture on my iPad so that you can see. Um, but my plan is actually to do all of my singles are going to be a gradient, two of them going in one direction. The third ply, the third single is going to go in the opposite direction. And that's how I'm going to apply them together. So two are going to kind of line up. The third is going to go in the opposite direction. And that is an idea you could find in yarn texture. Pretty sure she covers that. Okay, so let's see if I can show you a picture on my eye. Oh, look, I can. Okay, but will it go? Yeah. Ooh la la. That is the order that I'm going to do it in. They're so pretty. So pretty. 
<laughs> so that's really fun to have that when I need a little palette cleanser from my just straight off the sheep that I have my fun stickle bats and they have it's merino camel I think there's some alpaca there is some silk some sari silk so that's really fun to have something that's just different than my um pure little sweater spin over here so all right I think that is all I've got to show you we have two knit alongs going on right now. We have the Spin It to Knit It Traveler knit along where people have already finished cowls and whatnot because they either already had hand spun that they'd been working on since the patterns were released or they were using ready to knit yarn which is totally acceptable. So we have that going on. That's going to go for a whole year. We actually just added another prize to that. So um you can see the list of prizes on the Ravelry page. I also sent it out in my newsletter, but we've got a drop spindle, we've got fiber, we've got some patterns, all kinds of fun prizes for that knit along. And then we have the DRK March to May knit along. So we are our first week into the knit along and we also have great prizes over there. I'm really excited about the prizes for that knit along. Um, you can participate on Ravelry or on Instagram. I, I, you technically, I don't even think have to do, I should look up my own rules. I'm not gonna say anything else cause I'm just gonna stick my foot in it and be like, oh yeah, oops, I said I had to be in this way. So never mind. This is when I should learn how to edit my videos. But we have those two knit alongs going. I hope you'll join one of them. Um, and I'm actually currently finishing up the pattern for our May knit along challenge. And I'm pretty excited about it. So cross your fingers for me. I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to do, there's going to be an option, but right now I'm about to cast out the second one to see how that goes. And that is basically my plans for the weekend. It's going to be working on that with some spinning breaks thrown in. I just appreciate you being here. Thanks so much for asking questions, for coming back, or if you're here for the first time, welcome and hope to see you back next week. These videos go out pretty much every Friday. I try to get them out as early as I can. Um, Fridays, usually in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. If you want to know right when they come out, you can subscribe to this channel, which also is always a great way to help boost and support my business. So feel free to do that if you feel so inclined. And if you want to ask a question, you can find the link for asking questions in the show description at the bottom. And otherwise, I just hope you have a fantastic weekend and happy knitting. Bye.